I am going to be putting all the material uh, up on iLearn. So the uh, syllabus is up there. Um, I guess I forgot to ask you, so I guess you... There's no textbook for the course. <coughs> there are a lot of references down here. There's a lot of material that I'll show you next uh, on iLearn that you can download. So these are the topics covered, as I said. Uh, we're going to start off with an overview today of some abstract concepts of quantum mechanics, perhaps in a way that you know it's not initially presented to you in this way but I think if, if you made it all the way through Karatkov's course you will be familiar with bras and kets and inner products and stuff like that which is what we're going to use and as you can see here we're going to cover various things uh, the k.p we're going to start off with what's called a localized orbital approach which is um, heavily used in electronic band structure. Uh, then later we'll do k.p, which is heavily used by the people who do optoelectronics because it's really good for direct band gap materials. And you need direct band gap materials if you want to build an optical device like a laser or LED. So we'll do k.p <coughs> later on. Um, we will also do spend some uh, a grueling week or so going through spin orbit coupling and what that does. And so if you want to understand anything about spintronics, you need to understand spin orbit coupling. And especially like, you know, all the new hot TV <coughs> materials, not so new anymore, they were new a few years ago, like molybdenum disulfide, etc. Um, the thing that, one of the things that excited people was that the uh, they had really large spin orbit coupling, and so the valence bands are um, in each valley. Their their spin split by anywhere from 150 to 300 millivolts. So in each valley, um, you know, they act like perfectly polarized uh, 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 whole whole reservoirs in the valence band. And so people <coughs> had lots of ideas of what to do with that. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get into that. There's graphene, which is sort of the mother of all 2D materials um, and sort of forms a paradigm that's applied to the other 2D materials. So we will go through the band structure of graphene in detail, um, going through the full band structure and then finally deriving the simple 2x2 two two K.P. Hamiltonians that everyone uses to do what they call the low energy, uh, low energy states around the Dirac <coughs> point. How many people have heard of a Dirac point? One and a half? <laughs> it turns out that the um, energy momentum relationship in graphene is linear, just like light. So they say it has a relativistic band structure because it looks like the EK relationship of a photon, an omega K relationship of a photon. Uh, they call it a relativistic band structure and uh, the Dirac point is right, um, right at uh, <coughs> E equals zero, where these, the dispersion comes down to a single point. And we will go through that in detail. And i um, not sure how much we're going to be able to say about topological insulators. Uh, hopefully we can at least look at the simple uh, two by two Hamiltonian people use to uh, model the topological insulator and then you can see how the big deal about the topological insulator how many of you have heard of a topological insulator one Are we down to one now okay so um, you've all heard of insulator yeah. insulator you have a band gap okay right and in a topological insulator it turns out that in the bulk, there's a band gap, but at the surfaces, there is no gap. And you have this, again, a state that looks like this Dirac cone, same as graphene. And um, in a topological insulator, the big deal is that in these surface states, uh, the spin is uniquely locked to each momentum. So if you're moving in that direction, your spin is like this. The spin is always perpendicular to the momentum. 
And so if you have a net current, you have a net momentum going in this direction, which means you have a net spin in this direction. So a current carries a net spin. And so you can drive spin with current and use that to uh, um, think about, say, flipping a magnetic bit due to um, driving spin by a current. Another very, very hot topic. I don't know. I've been sort of <coughs> creating the first set of notes since it wasn't originally part of the course, but we've started doing a lot of work on this in our lab. It's a concept of the Berry phase, which also is about a band structure. And um, the Berry phase and the churn number, they give they map onto physical effects like uh, quantum anomalous Hall effect, spin Hall effect, where um, spin Hall effect very interesting where you can get a net spin current without any charge current. And it's all carried by electrons, but it just means the up spins are going this way and the down spins are going this way. And so there's no net charge current, but there's a net spin current because the spin current is defined as like up minus down. And since they're going in opposite directions, you have a net spin current, say going to the left. <coughs> All right, so all these interesting things that are a result of band structure, all these things I just mentioned um, are you know, continually sort of the frontier um, areas of research right now, like uh, um, topological insulators, berry phase, churn number, et cetera. <coughs> OK. Oh, uh, of course. What everyone really cares about is grading. Uh, that's the grading. It's just homework. Um, and since there is no no um, uh, no textbook to read, really all the information is transferred in the lectures. So it's kind of important that you're here. Uh, if for some reason you can't be here, and there will be some cancellations. I've got a couple of contract reviews this coming quarter. We'll see. Um, but just let me know. If like you have to go to a conference or something, for those of you who are busy doing research, um, I mentioned all this stuff, and that um, there are all kinds of hand handouts on iLearn. So let's take a look at them. So in course materials, let's see. First, the lectures. I guess what I did was I just uh, took the whole course from last year year and transferred it into this island. So actually these are all the lectures from last year at this point. So I guess what I'll do is I'll update them as I give them this year. But you actually have like the notes from the iPad and you have actually the videos of all the lectures from last year. Um, we'll see if I can keep that up. It's doing the videos is kind of painful getting all the and and what happened was um, I don't know, I learned, like, implemented some uh, quotas because the videos were taking up a lot of room. So last spring I had to move to YouTube. So for EE212, all the videos went up on YouTube. Um, we'll see. So that's what's in lectures. What else do we got? Handouts. So handouts is where all these photocopies. And so the lecture notes, these are the original my original handwritten lecture notes that I will be going through in class. Some of it I've modified, but at least gives you some something to go go by. Uh, so it's a photocopy of you know some original version of all this junk that you see in here. Um, and then the, these are all the handouts I was talking about in the um, syllabus. So for example. We'll, get, we'll go over this today. The um, matrix formulation, okay, well, you'll have to download it and rotate it. Um, matrix formulation of uh, quantum mechanics. So this is a book chapter from one of the uh, very old books from my advisor, Supra Data. And it's, it seems I've always found it to be one of the most readable uh, descriptions of what we're going to go through today. So if you don't like you know, my version, you can go see my advisor's version, which is here. Um, this is the, the, the section of you and Cardona we're going to be going through in some detail. Again, another chapter from Super, uh, another book from uh, Superdata. 
on uh, on what? I don't know on what. Why is this here? Must be. Oh, okay. When we start talking about, I guess, finite differences, and um, we'll see this form of the Hamiltonian later on. I don't know if we'll get there today or not. And oh, more stuff from Super Superio. Um, okay, he he did a lot of good stuff. So there's a lot of relevant stuff here from uh, two different books from uh, my advisor, Super Adana. Um, some historical papers when you know which won't mean anything to you yet and they won't mean anything to you for about the next five weeks maybe but after about five weeks or so they'll actually make sense um, these are some of the original papers on localized orbital theory and the tables that you'll find here the slater coster tables are still referred to this day and then other people have been you know, so this was done in 54 since then, people have come up with better parameters and continued to publish. Um, this looks like the whole PhD proposal of my former student, Kyer, in which he focused on the K.P method. So it just has a lot of details on the K.P method that we'll talk about much later in the course. And this is sort of the original article, because what we really do is we take the K.P method, which is kind of in case space, and then we discretize it to go back into uh, real space. And this, this, kind of, this paper here gives the um, procedure on how to do that that everyone has followed ever since. And this is just all kinds of information on um, parameters for 3.5 materials. If, I guess none of you here are probably working on 3.5s anymore, but they still are... Um, what's used in sort of optoelectronics, lasers, everyone uses 3.5, gallium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide for all your long haul uh, lasers with, uh, you need a band gap of, of about 0.75 EV and that's what these materials give you. And so if you ever need to know anything about band gaps, effective masses, spin orbit coupling parameters, all kinds of band parameters, you'll find many, many tables there in that last reference. Okay, so that's what's here in iLearn. So, I've been talking a lot about band structure. And does anyone, I mean, can anyone tell me what band structure is? What do I mean when I talk about band structure? Special energy versus K. That's exactly what it is. Um, but if, you know, how many of you have had like a device level course, like out of say a Streetman, you know, Ben Streetman type device level course, electron devices? Um, you know, okay, so people coming out of the hardcore EE background will. So I mean, so for a device, when you talk about like a PN junction, your most sort of fundamental paradigm for a device, I mean, the first thing people write down in the device course is something that looks like this where you have a conduction band edge and a valence band edge. I'm trying to find some common ground. Have you all seen a diagram that looks like that? Conduction band edge and a valence band edge and maybe then you'll put a Fermi level somewhere in between. This is the kind of band structure that you know if you've taken some really basic course you will have come across before and then if you dope it you know the classic band structure for the PN junction would look something like you would have okay this is an NP junction an N side a P side and you you bring your bands together and you have your in this case NP junction right this is P type this is N type and and this is sort of the in your basic electronic device course, this is about the, all you ever see a band structure for a material. And all of the material properties are really taken into account in about two parameters, your band gap and your effective masses for the holes and the electrons. And that 
you know, when you think about a device course, the only <coughs> thing that differentiates one material from another are those three things, your band gap and your effective masses. When you think of, you know, this complex crystal you're talking about, and somehow you've been able to take into account all its important properties in these two or three values is pretty amazing. Going from gallium arsenide, to silicon, to indium arsenide, you can get by pretty well just knowing these three parameters. You know, when you get, you know, when you start worrying about contacts, you may start have to worry about electron affinities and work functions and all that. But if you're if you're not worrying about the contacts, then this is the only thing that distinguishes one material from another, which is really pretty amazing. We're going to look considerably deeper into um, band structure than this. Okay, so I guess the first question is, you know, what do these lines? What are they really? And the the when I talk about band structure, I'm talking about this energy versus momentum relationship. So on the vertical axis, you'll have energy. On the horizontal axis, you'll have momentum or your wave vector, K. And so since I can only draw in 2D, I'll say that's Kx. This would be your wave vector in the x direction. And the reason we can do this is because in a crystal, the form of the wave function is always some periodic part that is the same in each unit cell times a plane wave. This is Bloch's theorem that you, know, you run across, hopefully, in like an introductory solid state course, a la Cattell, or something like that. Right? And so this plane wave k labels each state that I'm that k is a continuous variable. And later, um, if, if you're just worried about a single band, you know, each k labels this state. So sort of a one-to-one -one mapping between this and each state I can just label by its k vector, its wave vector k. And then I plot that energy momentum relationship. And in the simplest direct band gap type semiconductor, if I just look at the conduct, it'll be direct, which means that these band edges are k equals zero. So here's k equals zero. And then the conduction band will just look something like it's supposed to, I'm trying to draw symmetric, but my drawing isn't very good. So the conduction band is going to look something like this energy versus K. And the valence band and all these semiconductors we're going to be looking at initially, you actually have three bands down here. You have a heavy hole, a light hole, and a split off hole down here. Heavy hole, light hole, and split off hole bands in the valence band. And this is what the band structure is going to look like for most of the three fives, like gallium arsenide, indium arsenide, etc. All your direct band gap materials. And so what's the relationship between you know, these lines that I drew up above and this thing that I drew down below? Well, in your device course, the, those lines just represent the bottom of the bands. That's what we mean by EC, your conduction band edge, in your device course. And this, we already got a blue line here, but this would be my valence band edge, EV, <coughs> in your device course. Your device, in your device course, you only worry about stuff very close to the band edges. Because that's, for the most part, where, where the electrons and holes are very close to the band edges, the ones that are mobile and moving around. When you start worrying about optical stuff, then you excite the higher energies and you have to worry about stuff away from the band edge. So this thing, this, you know, this plot that I've drawn down here, 
Um, you know, where does it come from? Well, we're going to go through this in detail. We're going to spend a lot of time going through this. But this is really what comes out of the uh, solutions to Schrodinger equation in a crystal. When you solve Schrodinger's equation in a crystal, and a crystal is just some, something with a periodic potential, I mean, that's what defines a crystal. It has this infinite periodic potential. So when you solve something in a periodic potential, you end up with bands and band gaps. And you probably all did some problem in introductory quantum mechanics where you have some periodic potential and you solve it and you show that in some regions you get no solutions and other regions you get solutions. But this is an example. So in here, in this energy range, this is your band gap, there are no solutions. There are no states in that energy region. You don't have to take pictures. I'm going to upload all these notes onto ILO. I mean, you can take pictures if you like, but I'm going to uh, convert this all into a PDF file and upload them after each lecture. And if you notice, I drew, I, you know, I, I drew sort of a, a dashed line out here, and if I had drawn this better, all the slopes would have gone to zero right at this line. <coughs> and so this line represent in this 1D along Kx, the edge of the Brillouin zone. I don't know how many of you have heard of a Brillouin zone. Okay, so since your potential is periodic in real space, these solutions are periodic in K space. <coughs> and if I, and this, and this, you know, along this 1D Kx, this would go from pi over A, where A is your lattice constant to <coughs> negative pi over A. That would be the periodicity, so the, per, the, the, the sort of length of this Brillouin zone is 2 pi over A. And then after that, I just decided to stop it because the next, if I, I can keep plotting it, but it becomes redundant, it's just going to repeat itself. It's periodic in K space, just like the potential is periodic in real space. So once you've calculated this, <coughs> You know, this, so this is what, when I talk about band structure, this is what I'm talking about. Band structure. These EK plus, energy versus moment, plot versus momentum, or wave vector. Same thing. So momentum and wave vector, I kind of use them interchangeably, right? So momentum is just H bar K. So I kind of just, within the factor of H bar, they're the same thing. The wave vector, <coughs> the wave vector is this, this is, you know, and the wave vector is our your usual uh, 2 pi over lambda, where lambda would be the wavelength. And so the, um, if the maximum k vector is pi over a in your Bria 1 zone, then your maximum wavelength is uh, 2a. Thank you, 2a. <laughs> Or my minimum, my minimum wavelength is two, two a twice the lattice vector. Let's say you know, we're gonna know later how to actually calculate something this e k relationship. But once you have this e k relationship, you can get a lot, a lot of information from it. For example, your velocity is defined as v is <coughs> one over h bar d e d k. Or in, in 3D, you know, if, it, if you're thinking of a vector, 1 over h bar, grad k of e in three dimensions, this would give you the directionality. So once you calculate this e versus k relationship, you can uh, determine the velocity at any energy in any wave vector, the velocity of that state. So if an electron is in that state k, you know how fast it's moving. And this is simple, you know, this is if, since e is h bar omega, this is what you learned a long time ago, like in electromagnetics, right? The group velocity is just d omega dk, which is just 1 over h bar dE dk. All right, so that's just the group velocity. If you start thinking about electrons as waves, which you do in quantum mechanics, and that's the group velocity of your, your electron in that state. Um, the effective mass, so we were just talking, you know, this is 
in a course like Streetman and a device course, you just sort of given the effective mass. But then in this course, the effective mass is something you calculate, and you get it from the band structure. And once you've calculated this, you know, E is a function of K, then you can calculate the effective mass, 1 over m star is 1 over h bar squared d squared e dk squared and so usually you just calculate al along like the major axes along kx, ky, and kz and, and if your band structure is um, spherical like in gallium arsenide the conduction band would be the same um, and something like silicon you'd have like the longitudinal mass and the transverse mass because the band edge is an ellipsoid. Uh, but this is where it comes from. After you calculate the <coughs> EK relationship, E is a function of K, you do this and you get the effective mass and any energy and momentum. Usually, I mean that when you you know you look up in a uh, a data book, like you get on the web, you want to know the effective mass for gallium arsenide. And it's just a single number, right? It's just a number. It's not, you know, the way I wrote this, it could be lots of numbers, depending on what energy and what K you choose, right? I mean, you can define this. If we just look at the conduction band, EK, and I have a conduction band that looks like this. If I choose a K, you know, I can do this calculation wherever I like and get an effective mass. But when you look in the data book, the one they're giving you is right at the band edge, the effective mass at the band edge, which is this curvature at the band edge. And you know, for hole, for holes, well, I'll just multiply by negative one because no one likes negative masses. For holes, the curvature would be negative, but there's a negative sign in there if you're dealing with holes. Usually, you know, when you first start trying to analyze electron transport in semiconductors you use an effective mass model and so you say E is equal to h bar squared k squared over 2m star right this would be the effective mass model that you use in all your basic textbooks I mean this is exactly the dispersion the, you know, it's also called parabolic dispersion for obvious reasons because that's a parabola, right? That's a parabola centered at E and K equals zero. And so if I were to plot that dispersion on top of, let's say, the red is my real dispersion, so the parabolic dispersion, well, it's a parabola. It just keeps going up parabolically forever. It never turns over. It doesn't know anything about a Brillouin zone. So the only place that it kind of looks like the real dispersion is right near the band edge. Right near the band edge is a good approximation. And then depending on the material and the mass, as you move away from the band edge, it can, can become quickly a very bad approximation. So that's another reason we need to understand. Well, even for device analysis, realistic device analysis, parabolic, this parabolic model doesn't get you very far. And as you can see just from looking at that red curve, um, you know, somewhere in here there's an inflection point, right? You go from concave up to concave down, right? And so the second derivative is zero. So at that point, m is infinite, your effective mass. So you can see that this approximation quickly breaks down badly, again, depending on the material. Like for in, it'll break down faster for narrow band gap systems. It works really well for wide band gap systems. Um, the wider band gap systems, as we see, will tend to be more parabolic for 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 higher energies away from the band edge. For a narrow band gap system like indium arsenide with a band gap of about 0.35 EV, uh, this dispersion 
say for the conduction band, you know, it starts off parabolic, or everything starts off parabolic near the band edge, <coughs> unless you're doing, looking at gra graphene, for example. But there is no gap there. So it starts off parabolic, and then it very quickly just goes linear, or a very good approximation to linear, say for indium arsenide. And, you know, your parabolic approximation just leads you very, very far astray very quickly when you try to model indium arsenide using this uh, effective mass model. And so that's, you have to uh, know how to deal with that. You have to need, know something about band structure. Density of states, so your effective mass, I don't know how many of you remember density of states. How many of you are taking the course with Alex Belandon right now? EE202, yeah, EE202. Maybe there's an MSC version. Most of you? Yeah, okay, good. Because he'll be going over these fundamental <coughs> basic concepts of density of states. So you'll get a double dose of that. I'll be going over them faster because... Originally, this was meant to be a second-year course, but somehow it all got kind of compressed into the first year. Another place where you need to understand band structure is when you uh, are calculating or need to know something about the density of states. So people use different um, symbols for this. I think, you know, Cattell uses N of E, other people, I kind of like D of E to separate it, make, make clear it's not the electron density. Your density of states. Um, and this just tells you, in a 3D material, how many states you have. So the units of this is, would be 1 over energy. And the energy we're going to use throughout the course is EV, volume. So it tells you how many states you have in a unit volume per uh, at a given energy. And so if you integrate that over energy, weighted by, say, a Fermi factor, uh, you'll get, say, the electron density. You integrate over energy, you integrate out the energy, you're left with 1 over centimeter cubed, you have the electron density of your material. And now, if you calculate I wish I had had some expressions down, but if you, you know, again, in Cattell or Streetman, once you know the effective mass, they assume a parabolic band structure, and that immediately gives them this density of states. And um, I'm trying to remember, it's, it's like in 3D, it goes as like, Correct me if anyone can remember this. Well, you can look it up on the web. It's like m star maybe to the three halves and <coughs> square root of e in 3D. So those would be the dependencies. Your dependence, and there's a bunch of other constants, h bars. So. But, you know, in terms of what we're interested in, those are the dependencies, if I got that right, on the effective mass and the energy. And if you assume, this is assuming that the relationship between energy and momentum is this uh, parabolic one. So if you assume this on the left, then you can derive these standard expressions for the density of states, and you will do that in Alex's class uh, 202. Um, but if you look at this, you know, this density of states, well, it's just going to keep going up the square root of E um, because you've assumed the effective <coughs> mass is, doesn't change with energy, but we've just shown here that in reality, when you have a band structure like this, your mass is getting heavier with energy, right? Because the curvature is getting less as you go up. In fact, the curvature goes to zero somewhere and it actually turns <coughs> over and becomes negative. So as you go away from the band edge, the effective mass is getting heavier. And so if you go back here, I guess you could put in an energy dependent effective mass to try to compensate or, or change this. But what this means is that if you go ahead and calculate the electron density, you calculate that by integrating 
over energy, your density of states, which in this model is just square root of E, right? Times your Fermi factor, which tells you whether that state is filled or not. And if you, you know, use this parabolic model, you'll find out, depending on what material you're looking at, that um, for a given Fermi level, you can, your, your electron density is completely wrong. I mean, it's just order of magnitude off because, because this parabolic model is a really bad approximation for the real band structure and it's giving you a completely uh, inappropriate density of states as you move away from the band edge. Okay, so these are some, you know, sort of simple things where your ordinary uh, approach to band structure, which is really this, right? This is what you're going to see in, say, Cattell or Streetman. <clears throat> and it's good right near the band edge, but as soon as you move anywhere away from the band edge, uh, it can break down badly. Um, so density of states. Um, and the last thing, which we'll, we will also talk about, which has been a research topic ever since Isaki discovered the tunnel diode, and that is tunneling. So you've all come across the concept of tunneling, hopefully, quantum mechanical tunneling. And maybe you did some simple calculations of just, I'm sure that Krakow does that in, in his class. You have some barrier, and you can calculate, and you send in a plane wave. Some of it gets reflected. Some of it's going to go through. <clears throat> and you can calculate the tunneling probability of that happening. And there's... Um, you know, and if the barrier is thick enough, I don't know if you remember that the analytical solution maybe looks like a cinch function, but if it's thick enough, this tunneling probability, T, is E to the negative 2 kappa D, where D would be the thickness of your tunnel barrier. And this kappa, your decay constant, is the evanescent wave vector in the barrier. The evanescent wave vector in the barrier. I don't know if I can spell this. Evanescent wave vector in the barrier. So normally, if you have a propagating wave, you, it's e to the i kx. In the barrier, you say k becomes imaginary. So k goes to ik. And so in the barrier, this just becomes e to the negative kappa x, where kappa is ik. That's all. No, I, no kappa is not imaginary. I mean, k becomes ik. And then, okay, I'm just calling it kappa, just because I'm the barrier. Okay. Um, uh, I, I mean, the, the point is this kappa, which I will get to. I guess. Does anyone know why there's a factor of 2 here? I mean, this is what the wave function looks like. Does anyone know where that factor of 2 comes from? Okay. Remember I called it a tunneling probability. A probability is always like <coughs> psi squared. So it's related to the square of the wave function. That's why you have that factor of 2 in, in the tunneling probability. So the wave function is like e to the negative kappa x. The, the probability is going to be e to the negative 2 kappa d, where d is the... Uh, the uh, width of your barrier. Anyway, so the, the point is this kappa. So um, what is this kappa? Um, if we look again, we need to consider a real band structure. So in a real <coughs> band structure, I'll have a, a narrow band gap material here. I'll have a wide band gap material here. And then in there, back to my narrow band gap. Now I'm going to draw a funny, funny system where the alignment looks like this. But my, these are two different semiconductors. Where I'm drawing the conduction band 
and the valence band back to this first kind of band diagram. I'm just drawing the band edges. And so I've got a wide semiconductor, a narrow semiconductor. The lineup is kind of funny of the two uh, gaps. Okay. So this would be the conduction and valence band for this other semiconductor, EV and EC, up here. And um, each, each uh, semiconductor is going to have its dispersion, its EK relationship. So um, the narrow band gap material will have its EK for its uh, electrons and holes. The wide band gap material will have its own EK for its electrons and holes. Um, in between is the band gap. So if I inject an electron in the narrow band gap material close to the band edge towards my barrier like this, it, it um, you know, the way you do this in, in your class is you match wave functions and, and such. And so in the barrier, the eigenstates are going to be this E, e to the plus or minus kappa x in the barrier. And this kappa is determined by the imaginary band structure in the barrier. And so what you do in your parabolic model is you just, you just turn your parabola upside down. And that's how you choose your, you turn your parabola upside down. And in the barrier, you have this upside down parabola. And what, whatever this, whatever this k is from your upside down parabola, that, that's the k that goes in here. Um, in reality, what happens is that these, these two bands, the conduction band and the valence band, they actually have this evanescent band that wraps around and connects the top of the valence band to the bottom of the conduction band. So if I blow that up, I have my two real bands, and then I have this evanescent band that goes like this through the band gap. And this is the K that determines your, um, your tunneling probability. This is, the K that, this is the K that determines your kappa. And this, it turns out, depending on the material and such, can be very different than, um, because it wraps around, it can be very different than your parabolic approximation that would look like this. Because in this case, and this is a real case, this is indium arsenide aluminum antimonide, it turns out you're actually closer to the valence band than the conduction band. So you're actually tunneling through one of these, a state, a, a kappa state here, it's actually started turning around to go back to the valence band. So even though you're in the conduction band of the indium arsenide, what you're really doing is tunneling through the valence band of the aluminum antimonide. And you know the parabolic model just gets this incredibly, totally, utterly wrong. So the, you know, the parabolic K would be somewhere out here. The real, K, the real cap is, is much, much smaller, so you can tunnel much easier than you would expect from the parabolic model. So it's, it's, it comes into play uh, when you're tunneling, this wrapping effect and the imaginary <coughs> bands in the, um, in the gap. OK, so those are all the motivations of, and you know, th there's much more, but this is sort of stuff that's related to simple things that you've already seen, you've already done, but you did them with a parabolic model. And I'm giving you examples of how, you know, to, for these simple, simple things, even for that, you can need um, something considerably better than this parabolic model and something more than just a band gap and effective mass to model these materials and, and devices made from them correctly. Now I'm just going to do a review of notation that uh, we're going to be using a lot of. We're going to be doing, uh, focusing solely on the single particle Schrodinger equation. So we're not going to be doing any many, many body stuff here. 
Um, and the simple form that you've all seen and should know and love by now, and I'll write it down, is, uh, here it is, IH bar d d t psi is equal to the uh, kinetic term P squared over 2M plus some potential acting on psi. All right, that's Schrodinger's equation, and this is our Hamiltonian. For the most part, it's just going to become H, the Hamiltonian. And P is your momentum operator, which is I mean, minus IH bar grad. We're going to be using bra and ket notation a lot. We're going to be representing our wave functions and functions in general using this ket notation. Hopefully you've all seen that. Because we're probably going to be using it in ways that you really haven't used it before. Um, sort of making an analogy between what we do here with these, you know, this is really a function, and what you do with just normal three-dimensional vectors, because it's the same thing. We're dealing with linear spaces, and all the intuition you have about manipulating vectors, like dot products, not cross products, but dot products, um, applies to what we'll be doing here. And also, we're going to be doing something that, you know, even if you've used this notation, something you probably haven't done is finally taking our Hamiltonian and turning it into a real matrix, the kind of matrix that you would put into MATLAB or Mathematica to solve it. And that's why we go through this, because in all cases, we're going to end up with some, you know, real n by n matrix to solve and, and calculate the eigenvalues of. Okay, so if if you want to, since at the end of the day we're going to be dealing with real, you know, n by n matrices and column vectors and row vectors, if you want to think about this in, in, in that term, in, in those terms, this is your a column vector, right? This would be some column of, you know, C1, C2, dot, 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 a column vector. This is the, what they call the Hermitian conjugate, which is... We use a dagger symbol for Hermitian conjugate. And all that means is you take, um, you switch the rows and the columns, and in terms of our column vectors, it just means, and you complex conjugate everything. So this would become like C1 star, C2 star, dot, dot, dot. So this is a row vector. And so the dot product, you know, if I want to do, say, the dot product of two vectors, V dot U, which is a notation you're used to seeing with vectors. We can write that in terms of their components. Usually, I mean, the only thing different from what you've done before is that now the components can be complex. So the definition of the dot product with complex components is to uh, do this complex conjugation. So the row vector times the column vector, u1. U2 dot 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 UN, which is just you know the sum over I of V I star U I. Right, yes, you dot product, and in our new notation, this is simply written as V U. It's a scalar, it's a number, they call it the scalar product, the inner product, and in vector it's a dot product. Okay, so I'm just introducing this at this point to show you this is, you know, we can, if we're dealing with just normal vectors, then we can take our normal notation for the dot product, v dot u, and the, this bra and ket is notation is just another compact way of writing that dot product or scalar product or inner product. All our wave functions are normalized, which means that using this notation, just like you normalize a vector, that's the magnitude squared of the vector, means our wave functions are normalized. And now the most important concept, probably, is the basis for a vector space. <coughs> okay, and to start by an example. So the one that you know is your three-dimensional space 
And your bases are just, you know, your x hat, y hat, z hat, right? You can write any vector in your 3D space as a linear combination of x hat, y hat, and z hat. And to make save notation, I'm going to call this x1 hat, x2 hat. Just refer to them by indices so I can start doing summations <coughs> over indices. We all agree we can write any vector as a linear combination of x hat, y hat, and v. So if I'm, if I'm given some arbitrary vector, v, I know I can write it as, you know, c1 x1 hat plus c2 x2 hat plus c3 x3 hat. So if you know what v is, and you know, formally, how do you figure out what, what are C1, C2, and C3? To get C1, I would just take the dot product of X1 hat with V. Right? And if I do that, I mean, if I just take the dot product of X1 hat with V, both sides of that equation, right? X1 hat dot V. That's just going to give me c1. It's going to because these vectors are all orthonormal, right? X1 hat dot x2 hat is zero. X1 hat dot x3 hat is zero. X1 hat dot x1 hat is one. So I just end up with c3. So I can formally now write this out as v. My vector v is equal to sum i equals 1 to 3, um, x i hat times, and now my c i is just x i hat dot v. Right? We just said that c i is x i dot v. So that's just <coughs> writing that out. That's a summation. Right? This is trivial, but people get lost. Is everyone hanging with me here? Right? We just said, I mean, from up here, each one of these is just C sub I. That's the weight. Right? C1 from up here. So I just have C1 x1 hat plus C2 x2 hat plus C3 x3 hat. And in our new notation, that's equal to uh, sum A equals 1 through 3 in our bra and ket notation. X i hat is just written as a ket, right? That's my X i hat. And the dot product is just X i, this inner product, X i and V. I've just used two different notations, that's all. all right, this, is, this is my dot product. It's my xi dot b, and the ket on the left is just my xi hat. But now you see something, when I do this, there's something rather interesting here. I have a v on the left, and I guess I can put this into, to make it real clear. I have a v on the left. I have a v over here on the right, multiplying something by it. So formally, this looks like v is some thing which operating on v and by definition the only thing that thing can be is the identity operator right? v equals something times v 
only thing that could possibly be. This is a linear space we're dealing with. Everything's got to be linear, so this is the identity operator. So this thing is sum i equals 1 to 3 of xi xi is your identity <coughs> operator in this you know, 3D vector space. You take any vector, you hit it with that, and you get the vector back. I mean, this is sim I mean, uh, the concepts are what my daughter just did in 10th grade. I mean, the concepts are really simple. We're just playing with a lot of s symbols here. Right? This is dot products of vectors. <coughs> Not cross products, they're harder. Dot products. We can generalize this, what we just did for, you know, <coughs> three vectors that form the basis for any vector in 3D space for um, a set of orthonormal functions that form a basis for all the functions in some space of interest, like a, uh, a quantum well for a particle in a box. And those set of functions would be like your sine n pi over w x. Right? You can write any wave function in there, some linear combination of these sine functions because they satisfy the boundary conditions and they satisfy the homogeneous, they satisfy Schrodinger's equation. So that would be an example of a set, and they're orthonormal. So we're going to do this mapping from what we just did with, with just vectors, or the normal vectors we know and love in 3D space, to uh, functions, a space of functions in which um, you can write any function as a linear combination of this orthonormal basis set. And so, you know, if you're de dealing with, say, an infinite square well, then an orthonormal basis set is, uh, my normalization is like 2 over w, root 2 over w sine uh, n pi over w x for some inf you know, infinitely high box of width w. I can write any any function in that box as some linear combination of those where n is just an integer. They all satisfy the boundary conditions. They would all satisfy Schrodinger's equation. So I can write any function in that space like that. In 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 three D space, another set of uh, basis functions that you all know and hopefully love. I'm going to write them with this normalization. 1 over root of the volume, which we let go to infinity, so that they all have the same units, e to the i, k dot r. So that would be another orthonormal set of functions. And we can write any other function as a linear combination of those. It's called a Fourier transform. And when the functions become continuous, in this case k is continuous, then this dot product is going to involve an interval. But the concept is, is the same. You can write any, any function in 3D space as this linear combination of plane waves, summing them all up. Since k is continuous, that sum becomes an interval, but it's the same concept. OK, so we have an identity operator. Um, oh, looks like we're done, aren't we? And we this finishes at 6.30? We go from 5.10 to 6.30? Okay, well, I was just getting going here. Okay, so, and we meet, it's, it's weird schedule, Monday, Wednesday, is that right? Yeah. Monday, Wednesday. Okay, so I guess we'll take it up here on uh, Wednesday. I'll, I'll turn these into PDFs, upload them as I claim, and um, see you Wednesday. <coughs>